Else, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Hello, I'm Calvin Robinson. Do not miss my Common Sense Crusade Saturdays at 7 p.m. Join me for some in-depth discussions on faith. Is that not the start of the slippery slope? It's very much so. And the big moral questions of the day. <laughs> I'm baffled. You've got some nerve. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome to Gloria Meets. Coming up for you this evening, former Justice Secretary Robert Buckland. Whilst I think a crackdown on illegal migration is perfectly fair and proper, at the same time we need to know what those safe and legal routes the government wants to adopt are going to be, what they look like. Labour's Shadow Trade Secretary Nick Thomas-Simmons. Making sure where there are these very serious situations, there are still staff available. It's also one of the reasons I think why public opinion has remained so strong in favour of, what NH of, of our NHS staff and a fair deal for them. Conservative MP Stephen Hammond. I don't really regard these people as journalists. I regard them as scam merchants who, you know, if they'd done that to my constituents, I'd be on to the ICO trying to make sure that they were shut down. All that right after your news. One minute past six, I'm Ray Addison in the GB Newsroom. The government is launching a review to find out why some mobile phone users did not receive today's emergency test alert. <laughs> At 3pm, most people received a message on their home screen, along with a sound and vibration, for up to ten seconds. However, users on some networks, including three, did not. There's also been reports that some people have not been able to make or receive calls since the test. Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden says the alert could save people's lives in the future. It's the case that this has been developed with the National Cyber Security Centre, which forms part of a GCHQ. There will be a very strict procedures in place for its authorisation, and it will only be used in a situation where your viewers' lives are in danger. I'm determined that there is a very high bar for the usage of this. The Prime Minister has hailed the brave efforts of the UK's armed forces after they helped British diplomats and their families to escape fighting in Sudan. The armed forces carried out a complex mission in the capital Khartoum alongside other allies. Hundreds of civilians have died in the violent conflict between the Sudanese army and a rival paramilitary group. Foreign Secretary James Cleverley says the government is continuing to ensure the safety of British nationals who remain in the country. We have taken the decision to temporarily close the embassy and to relocate our embassy staff. 
that gives us a, uh, the best opportunity to project our diplomatic support back into Sudan. But we remain absolutely committed to support British nationals in Sudan. We will do so in close coordination with our international partners. But the best thing that we can do to support British nationals and indeed everyone in Sudan is push the generals involved in this conflict to bring it to an end. And that will remain the priority of our diplomatic focus in the region. Diane Abbott has been suspended as a Labour MP pending an investigation after she claimed that Jewish people are not subject to racism. In an article for the Observer newspaper, the former Shadow Health Secretary said Jewish people experienced prejudice like Irish or red-headed people, but not racism. She's since withdrawn the remarks and apologised for any offence caused. However, the Labour Party has condemned the comments, calling them deeply offensive and wrong. Labour's London Mayor, Sadiq Khan, has described it as unacceptable. I don't understand how anybody can think that, how anybody could say that, but even worse, write a letter uh, to the Observer to uh, publish that it's right she's apologised. The Labour Party's done the right thing to uh, suspend her at beggar's belief. The Home Secretary says it's crucial that the government has the power to deport migrants without being blocked by the European Court of Human Rights. In the Sunday Telegraph, Suella Braverman said for Britain to be, quote, truly sovereign, it needs to be able to decide who enters our territory. This comes after 11 small boats carrying nearly 500 people crossed the English Channel yesterday. Leader of the Liberal Democrats, Sir Ed Davey, says the government isn't doing enough to tackle this issue. The backlog of asylum applications that have not been processed is 160,000. That's the problem, and this does nothing to solve that. Liberal Democrats want this problem solved, but the government is just being in chaos and can't even do the basics right. So Mo Farah has finished ninth in his final London marathon with a time of two hours and ten minutes. Kenya's Kelvin Kiptum smashed the course record to win the men's race in the second fastest time ever. Dutch athlete Sifan Hassan won the women's race. At least 45,000 people took part today, raising £60 million for charity. And two new pictures of Prince Louis have been published as he celebrates his fifth birthday today. He's been photographed being pushed in a wheelbarrow by his mum. Louis is expected to accompany his siblings in the procession from Westminster Abbey during the King's coronation next month. We're on TV, online, on DAB Plus Radio and on TuneIn 2. This, of course, is GB News. Time now for Gloria Meads. Former Cabinet Minister, former Justice Secretary Robert Buckland, delighted uh, that you're here today. We're going to start on something personal to you. We're going to start by talking about the fact that your 20-year-old daughter, Millie, has autism. Now, she's not here, so I'm going to ask how it affected you, her dad, as you were growing up, as she well, was growing up. I think like many parents, many families, we've been through the journey of, first of all, identifying the issue trying to get help, trying to get a diagnosis, and then working our way through the system, which was a challenge for us and is a huge challenge for many, many families across the country. I think people are very much aware of autism, but we've still got a long way to go, I think, in terms of provision, both for, uh, for children and indeed opportunities for adults in employment. And as my child you know, go, grows into adulthood, like any parent, we ask the question, what's going to happen next? What will happen after we are gone? All these questions wake you up in the middle of the night. Uh, and therefore, I thought using those experiences was really the least I could do as an MP. Uh, uh, and therefore, I chair the all-party group on autism. And now I'm leading a review for the government into opportunities for employment and increased employment for autistic people, because the figures are shockingly low. Only two out of 10 adults, autistic adults, have a job. And that really, really yes, two out of 10. So we've got to do better than that. What do you think it should be? It should be 10 out of 10, shouldn't it? Well, I mean, uh, what I'll say as uh, you know, neurotypical people, 
8 out of 10 have a job, disability generally 5 out of 10, and here we are with autism 2 out of 10. Now that's not the fault of autistic people, we've got to work with business and industry to remove some of those uh, you know, obvious stumbling blocks to opening up uh, not just the recruitment of autistic people, but the retention as well in jobs. And that's the work I'm going to be doing with the DWP and with Autistica, one of our leading research charities, over the next few months. What do you think the primary prejudices are from employers? I, I think there's a worry that somehow there's a risk employing p autistic people, that there will be a, a problem in terms of attendance or reliability. Now, nothing could be further from the truth. Companies that are employing autistic people are reporting huge benefits from different ways of thinking, different ways of working, and a real, a true diversity when it comes to the talents that autistic people have. And I want to spread that best practice. I want it to be shared and become universal so that we can deal with what is a problem of so-called economic inactivity for hundreds of thousands of people in our country. And that's the aim of this review. And final question on this, when do you hope the review will be completed by? Well, I don't want to mess about. I want to get on with this this year and I'd like it published in the autumn so that then government can respond and we can get on with the job of recruiting and retaining tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands more autistic people in employment. Fantastic. That statistic, two in ten. Wow. Thank you for, for telling us about that. Um, you were in charge of our justice system. I wanted to ask you about the protests, the climate protests that are, well, I mean, they're, they're sort of part of our lives now, but tens of thousands are expected this weekend in the capital. Have we got the balance right between protecting the right to protest and protecting the rights of people who are just going about their, their, day, their ordinary business, want to be in the London Marathon, what have you? Well, that balance was very much in my mind when we brought forward legislation to strengthen police powers and to make sure that important and much-loved events like the London Marathon aren't disrupted by people who, whilst they have a right to express their view, don't really have the right to disrupt the lives of the rest of us, thank you very much. And that's why I think the legislation, the laws that we've passed, strike that balance. You know, a responsible protest group will talk to the police and say, look, we want to make this demonstration. How can it work best for everybody? Uh, and then the police will, of course, take into account the right to free speech and accommodate and seek to help groups that want to make legitimate protests. But what I think is unacceptable, and I think unacceptable to the vast majority of the British people, is this you know, sudden uh, lightning strike without any warning, disrupting not just everyday lives and going about our lawful business, but big events like the London Marathon. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I, I like running and I, I, I haven't done a marathon, but I've done a few half marathons. Very good. Time, and you need to just focus and concentrate on the road ahead. And I can't think of anything worse than a protester disrupting what is often charitable fundraising. So, you know, my plea to them is, look, think again, please, guys. You know, make your point, but don't make it in a way that upsets and disrupts uh, much-loved events like the marathon. Very good. Um, I want to talk to you about immigration now. Uh, firstly, about what's happening in your constituency. I believe there are five refugee hotels in your Swindon constituency. Is that right? Well, I think that Swindon has a proud history of welcoming and accepting asylum seekers. And we have local charities like the Harbour Trust that do great work. And I've got to say the local council is good too. But, you know, we're, whilst we're prepared to do our bit, I think it's really important that people don't presume or abuse the hospitality that we have, which is why it was very important to me that the Home Office gave me an undertaking that they wouldn't increase the number of hotels in our local area and would work very hard to resettle, particularly our Afghan uh, guests who want to be able to settle in the UK and who've left real persecution. And I think it, locally, if that issue can be dealt with, we have two hotels with uh, a a a Afghan refugees in them. If that can be worked upon, and there's a special government programme to do that announced last month, I think that would be really welcome. But, you know, my, my plea has been, we've got 
uh, asylum seekers, not able to do anything. Some of them are going on the black market and working for half the minimum wage. Why aren't we honest about it and actually get them into into work, get them registered so we know who they are, where they are, and you know, paying a contribution towards their keep? I think that's common sense, and I think we should be doing much more of that. The government have announced plans, or say they are soon to announce plans, uh, to house newly arriving migrants on perhaps military bases mm. or disused ferries. What I'm not clear about is whether the government plan to stop using hotels that have been currently used and to move those uh, people, those migrants out of those hotels and into perhaps more suitable uh, accommodation. What's your preference on that? Well, I think the government has to do both. I think it's got to move people out of hotels. Let's face it, these are legitimate businesses that could be serving the tourist industry or, or indeed local employment uh, and indeed local uh, jobs, people coming to work in, for example, Swindon. Uh, and I want that to come back to normal as soon as possible. So in my view, they need to be doing uh, firing on all cylinders, you know, using appropriate accommodation in the way you described, but also then stopping this undue reliance on, on, on hotels to house often very disparate groups of people, families in perhaps very inappropriate settings, and offering, you know, I, I think a better, frankly, a more humane way of dealing with this problem. The Illegal Immigration Bill is back in the House of Commons next week. You have expressed some concerns about those proposals. Will you vote for them next week? Well, I, I need to see exactly what, what the amendments are, what, what, what proposals will come forward. I'm pretty sure, and I hope that the government are listening to the point that uh, I and others are making about the need to do everything uh, at the same time. So whilst I think a crackdown on illegal migration is perfectly fair and proper, at the same time, we need to know what those safe and legal routes the government wants to adopt are going to be, what they look like, uh, you know, how that's going to be arranged. And together with the government's commitment to have a cap on, on uh, um, asylum seekers, which I th again think is reasonable, that we're doing you know, all these measures in a synchronised way. So if we get more of a sense of that synchronicity next week, I think that will uh, certainly impress me and others who have expressed concerns about this. So you're looking to be convinced before you vote for that? Well, of for the course proposals. I am. And, and, you know, I'd be, I'll be more than happy to engage um, with colleagues on this issue in the days ahead. OK. Um, second jobs. MPs, should they have them? It's a live debate. You are a practising barrister yeah. as well as being an MP. Some people say you can't give a full service to your constituents because of that. I totally disagree. If I was a doctor, I don't think there'd be, or a nurse or an, another professional, I don't think anybody would be having this debate. I think it's entirely leg legitimate for somebody like me, who was 20 years as a lawyer before I ever became an MP, to want to maintain my qualification. Uh, and I think it brings a lot more to the table. You know, I feel that I was able to contribute uh, with much greater authority to debates in Parliament because of my professional experience. And I think that now that I'm no longer a minister, it's actually actually incumbent upon me to not sort of stay in the Westminster bubble in that little comfort zone, but to go outside and to relearn some of those skills and to bring them back in to Parliament. But you know, the biggest second job I had, Gloria, it was being a minister and being a cabinet minister, which was an all-consuming task. And, you know, I simply say to people, you know, it's a different type of second job, but it's legitimate and, in fact, it's healthy for politicians to do that rather than just be boring, one-dimensional career politicians who have to depend upon the whips for uh, their meal ticket and, and, and have nothing else to fall back upon. Speaking of dimensions, I read that you have many other interests. Music is a big passion of yours. What sort of music are you oh, into? Yeah, well, jazz is my first love. And I love, you know, the great American popular song, the great standard, the Cole Porters and the Irving Berlins and all those wonderful Gershwin tunes. And I, I've got a pretty weird memory for lyrics. So when it comes to karaoke, I don't need the screen really? for a lot of these great songs. So I can just sort of you know, sing them off Pat. Do you do karaoke? Well, I do. I have done. And I'm always happy to, you know, pick up the mic uh, and have a go. And, uh, no, singing and music's been a huge part of my life since I can't remember when. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it, it, it keeps me, keeps me, keeps me sane, keeps me, my feet on the ground. 
What's your go-to karaoke song? Well, I do like a bit of Frank Sinatra, so oh. I could do My Way, That's Life, yeah. New York, New York, Brilliant. all the big showstoppers, always happy to, <laughs> to lay down a line and get everybody to join in. Uh, I'm trying to think of a quick pun. Well, that was Robert <laughs> Buckland's real me. He did it his way. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Robert Buckland. That. That's been a genuine pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lawyer. Coming up, Shadow Trade Secretary Nick Thomas-Simmons. It was an extraordinarily uh, difficult uh, period. She'd been ill for a couple of years uh, with, with cancer, so that was a, a really hard uh, period. Coming up, Conservative MP Stephen Hammond. But I've always tried to do things honestly and to act for the best of my Yeah, you know, and I suppose I took it very hard that you know, my reputation had been completely traduced for having done nothing wrong. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic, we do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <laughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Saturday nights on GB News. From 6pm, I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Saturday nights on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Shadow Trade Secretary Nick Thomas-Simmons, uh, thank you for joining us for The Real Me. Uh, this is an interview format where we try and dispel some myths. And my pre preconception about you when you came into Parliament was because of your double-barrelled name is that you were posh. <laughs> but that's not the case, is it? No, and the, the double-barrelled surname comes about because my late mother, uh, Pam, decided that there was no reason why I couldn't have her maiden name uh, as well as my father's surname. So when I was named, uh, I was given both names. I became Nick Thomas Simmons. And actually, 
that name does mean a great deal to me because whenever I hear my name called in the House of Commons, I'm called as Nick Thomas Simmons. And it always reminds me of my mother because she's the person that gave me that name. What did your mum do? My mother worked in a factory in my hometown of Blanavon. Uh, she had that job up until just after I was born and then she gave up the job. She never went back to work uh, after I was born, but she had a profound influence on me and on my politics. And your dad, what did he do? So my father uh, was a steel worker. Uh, he started off as an apprentice in Lamwern Steelworks, uh, worked his way up, became uh, an industrial chemist. And uh, both he and my mother undoubtedly have shaped uh, my politics. So you become an Oxford tutor, age 21. You're an academic, you're a historian. Uh, you are an author, you were a barrister. Very different worlds to the one in which you grew up in. Is there a, one of those worlds where you felt most out of, out of place? I never felt out of place, but always uh, you do occasionally have bits of imposter syndrome where you step aside from yourself and then you look at yourself, you look at the things that you're doing on a daily basis. Uh, and I think when I was a barrister in particular, when I started as a, as a barrister, you, you do a range of, of law when you start before you, you eventually specialise. And I can remember representing people when I did criminal law for you know, two or three years. And you get this remarkable window into other people's lives. You see this human drama in the courtroom of how uh, people's uh, lives are, the things that people do. And you, you do always think back to your own experiences and you, you do sometimes have this little part of you, particularly when you walk out of court at the end of the day, that thinks, was that actually me? So you lost your mum on New Year's Day in 2018. How did you deal with the grief of losing your mum? It was an extraordinarily uh, difficult uh, period. She'd been ill for a couple of years uh, with, with cancer, so that was a, a really hard uh, period. Obviously, I represent, I'm very lucky to represent my home constituency in Parliament, but it meant me being away, as I always am during the weeks, Monday to Wednesday, Monday to Thursday, depending on the parliamentary business that week. But whenever I could get back to spend time with her, to I used to take her, for example, to chemotherapy appointments when she was having that treatment. Uh, and I came home from Parliament for the Christmas recess in 2017. And she was very, very ill by, by that point. Uh, and that was the, you know, the, last, the last couple of weeks uh, of, of, of her life. But... She, although she was very ill, we were still able to, to talk right up until the, the very, very uh, final days. What really helped me, oddly enough, though, was actually the parliamentary crisis that was going on at that time, because it was a hung parliament, which meant that every single vote mattered. You, you couldn't simply have time away from parliament. And... My mother died on the New Year's Day of 2018. Her funeral was on the 15th, which was, and the reason I remember is it was precisely two weeks later. But that night, there was a series of votes in Parliament. I had no option but to be there because some votes were going, there, was, there were tiny margins. And so, although in one way, having been to the funeral that day, having this, you know, this churn of emotions all day. In some ways, it was difficult to get on the train to come back. But in others, because I had to do it, I had no option but to do it, actually having my time taken up with that intense parliamentary business did actually help because I had no time to sit, to think. I just had to get on with it. And that, in a curious way, was helpful. Yeah, I think a lot of people relate to that. What's it like to shadow Kenny Badenoch? More from Nick Thomas Simmons after the break. Experience tells me that when this government lords trade deals is fantastic, you should always wait a few days and look at what they've actually conceded.
I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you know Kate Moss? Moss? <laughs> Apparently. Uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I've walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, yeah. suffering on a scale completely uh, unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. Right, folks, that was a spicy one, wasn't it? With us four, plus a special guest. Sometimes she has to stick her foot in it. Sometimes she has to say things as they are. Sometimes I think we should keep the refugees and send the pensioners to Rwanda. <laughs> then we'd be in a much better state. Well, yeah. 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 The Saturday Five. Saturday nights from 8. Only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6pm, Monday to Friday on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel.
GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Hello, I'm Calvin Robinson. Do not miss my Common Sense Crusade Saturdays at 7pm. Join me for some in-depth discussions on faith. Is that not the start of the slippery slope? It's very much so. And the big moral questions of the day. <laughs> I'm baffled. You've got some nerve. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office. I'm Jonathan Vautry. After a mixed setup throughout the weekend, we are going to retain that theme at least into the start of the new working week as well. Low pressure is still going to be with us into Monday, even though it's slowly drifting its way off to the east. It is allowing, though, a feed of northerly air to push its way in, so temperatures are going to be falling down for pretty much all of us. That will allow snow to fall over the Grampians and higher grounds of Scotland throughout Saturday night sleep to lower levels as well. Further rain for Northern Ireland, but generally across England and Wales, the showers will fade off a bit more, allowing some clearer intervals to develop, and a patchy frost is possible, particularly across some central areas of Scotland. The rain from Northern Ireland will shift its way into Wales and southwest England as we head throughout Monday morning, and then the cloud will build into central and southern areas of England later on into the afternoon. Some clearer, sunnier intervals for the northern half of the UK, but still with a scattering of showers, particularly in the north and the east, where they could still be wintry. It is going to be quite blustery across northern and eastern coasts throughout Monday and feeling really quite chilly if you are exposed to that cold even underneath the persistent cloud further south as well. This rain then pushing its way through for Monday evening, so a damp end to the day, particularly across parts of Sussex and Kent, but eventually clearing its way off, and a number of clear intervals will develop into Monday night. That, though, is going to allow temperatures to really plummet, and we are expecting a much more widespread frost to develop and really quite a cold start to Tuesday morning. It does, though, mean that there'll be a good amount of sunshine to start off the day. And once that helps heat things up a bit more, it will be a relatively more pleasant day, particularly compared to Monday, with a good amount of sunny intervals for many. The wind's easing down in the east as well, but still a scattering of showers to contend with. The outbreaks of rain look to return as we move towards the middle part of the week, but temperatures will also be on the rise. Bye-bye. You are a dad of three children. In 2016, your wife gave birth to William. At seven weeks old, he was rushed to hospital with chronic renal failure as he was born with just one kidney. Did you ever fear you would lose William? It, it, we did have, uh, we did have that, that fear. And that, that period now, when I look back at it, I just wonder and marvel at how my wife Rebecca and myself ever, ever got through it. And there's part of it now that just doesn't seem very real when I look back. But when he was taken ill initially, uh, he originally went to a, a local hospital. I was in London. I remember waking up early morning in London. I had, I think it was about 27 missed calls from, from my wife. So. I saw it, panicked, immediately jumped on the train, went you know, straight back to, to, to South Wales. He was taken by ambulance to a specialist hospital, wonderful, wonderful hospital, by the way, Noah's Ark in Cardiff, absolutely remarkable uh, care that he had. But he had a, an operation that was a life-saving operation. It took place in the early hours of the morning 
the hospital had to find a specialist surgeon to do it and to actually get her out of bed. She lived in the north of Cardiff to come and do this operation. And it wasn't a case of having a conversation before the operation of do you give consent and do you understand the risks and all these kind of things when you have ordinarily have an operation. Her words have always stuck with me. She said, I think I can do it. Gosh. And in fairness to her, she did. It turned out to be something of, of turning a corner because it took William out, out of the life danger that, that he was in. But there were to be four more major operations. So he had five operations in the first six months of his life. It was a, an incredibly difficult period, as you can imagine, because I've got two other children, two uh, Matilda and Florence, my, my daughters. So we had to find a way of Rebecca, my wife, virtually living in the hospital with William, looking after the, the two girls uh, at home where I live in Abersuckin in my constituency, but also trying to represent my constituents in London, relied on our family an awful lot to get through it. But it was, it was this extraordinarily intense period that, that looking back now, I do wonder how we managed to do it. That sounds really tough. And you talked about the difficulty of getting that surgeon, getting the surgeon out of bed now. We are about to see more nurses strikes. We are seeing junior doctor strikes. If William was in that position, you can contemplate, you would contemplate, any parent would contemplate. Would William have made it if there had been strikes during that moment? Provided there are the derogations in place. And this, this is why it's so, so important. And we've been saying about this, you know, I've been saying this, other members of the Shadow Cabinet saying this in recent weeks, that we completely understand the frustration of our brilliant NHS staff, not just where they are at the moment with the cost of living, but the last 13 years of squeeze investment in the NHS. But try to make sure that those derogations are in place. Derogations, just explain what you mean. So what I mean by that is where there are life-threatening situations that staff are still provided. And I think keeping those derogations in place, making sure that where there are these very serious situations, there are still staff available. It's also one of the reasons I think why public opinion has remained so strong in favour of what NH of, of our NHS staff and a fair deal for them. OK, so you shadow Kemi Badenoch, I the did. Trade sec Secretary, and she's really happy at the moment. She is hailing the pact with 11 Asian and Pacific countries as fantastic news for British consumers and companies. Is it well done to Kemi from you? Well, look, I always like to see new markets opened up for our brilliant exporters. I am so proud of our exporters right across the United Kingdom. I've got an exporter in my constituency in Torbine Frog Bikes that supplies the US cycling team. You know, we've got exporters all across the country that are doing these great iconic things that we should be really, really proud of. So of course I want to see new markets. As ever though, with this government, the devil is in the detail. I, I've, I've watched other deals lauded as wonderful. Uh, take the Australia deal, for example. Then as soon as ministers are out of office, they tell us how terrible they are. So George Eustace, who of course was in the cabinet, leaves the cabinet and says that the Australia deal just isn't up to it. The prime minister, when he was temporarily out of office, told us it was very one-sided. So experience tells me that when this government lords trade deals as fantastic, we should always wait a few days and look at what they've actually conceded. OK, uh, finally, but I was reading a speech that you made about the next Labour government establishing rules to ensure that trade negotiators have binding responsibilities yes. to help deliver economic opportunities in their trade negotiations throughout the UK to all our wonderful towns and cities um, outside of and nations outside of the southeast of England. Tell me how that would work in practice. So there's two really important aspects to this. The first is the duty that is on our negotiators, both in the period they're negotiating, to regularly report back to me as the Trade Secretary, as to the progress they've made and the impact it's having. But also, when you actually get to complete a trade deal. I just don't, I don't want to see just 
statistics about uh, GDP for the whole country. I mean, we, we just mentioned the CPTPP, for example, as the acronym that, that it's known by, where the government modelling says we'll have 0.08% to our GDP over the next 10 years. I don't want to just see a statistic like that. What does that mean for people up and down the country? What does it mean for their communities? What does it mean for opportunity across the country? And if my trade negotiators come back to me and they can't give me that information, then there will be changes in the way the negotiation is taking place and we won't be completing deals that don't have that benefit across the country. But secondly, my plan is to actually create as well what we call climate export hubs in every nation and region of the UK. We have a wonderfully inventive people. And you think of the emerging climate technologies, the carbon capture and storage, so many other things, offshore, onshore wind, all these things. We can lead the world in that, both in what we're doing here, but in exporting that technology to the world. And in recent weeks, I was very proud to announce the one that is going to be created in Wales uh, alongside uh, Vaughan Gething. And I will look to do that for every nation and region of the country. Trade can benefit the whole country, but you need a government leading that. Nick Thomas-Simmons, we did personal, we did politics, and we did where the personal meets the political. Thank you Thank very you. much indeed. Thank you. Coming up, Conservative MP okay. Stephen Hammond. But I am clear that uh, I want to see the government accept some of those amendments next week. Uh, and then if I, if I don't get that, uh, I am prepared for the first time for a very long time uh, to vote against the government on those. Conservative MP for Wimbledon since 2005, Stephen Hammond. Great to chat to you today. Tell me when you first knew you were a Conservative. I, I, I guess quite early on in many ways, but I didn't really do very much about it politically until after university. I mean, I, I, when I was at school, I was fascinated by um, a, an event in Australia where the Queen's representative chucked out the government. And, you know, at that stage, it's thought to me, this is very odd. You know, how does politics work? You know, what's it there for? How should a country be run? Uh, and way, how do we make a, the best for any country? So I started to think about it, you know, when I was in my mid-teens, but really only got actively involved after I'd left university. And then I was running someone else's election campaign and someone came to talk, actually, Ken Clark came to talk for this chap. And afterwards, he said to me, what are you doing wasting your time organising it? You should be running. And it was at that point... I thought, actually, this is what I want to do with my life. Um, so for me, it was a process of evolution, not revolution. OK. You've been in the news lately. Uh, a number of MPs were approached by a fake South Korean company, which was part of a campaign uh, by, led by donkeys. You were one of them. Just tell me what happened in, in, in your own words. Well, what happened was a process that um, I got an email saying, you know, we're an advisory board, we're looking to set up an advisory board, we're a group of manufacturing companies, um, we've got a number of interesting clients. Uh, I looked at their website, which was there, they'd set up a fake website. Um, they came back to me and said, would I be interested in a preliminary interview? Um, I think that for a lot of us who have worked in the commercial world, it's not unusual to get approached by people and have a very preliminary invitation. I made it very clear I wouldn't break any parliamentary rules. I made it very clear that I, you know, it was up for them to decide what they wanted to, um, to pay. I mean, I think the two things I've learned out of this are one is that I don't really regard these people as journalists. I regard them as scam merchants who, you know, if they'd done that to my constituents, I'd be on to the ICO trying to make sure that they were shut down. Because actually, the story here was that we tried to scam someone they said they're not going to break any rules, they're not going to break the spirit of any rules. Now, it's perfectly legitimate, I think, to say MPs shouldn't have second jobs, but it's not legitimate to break data pro uh, protection rules. Uh, and I think that is, a, is the real story here as well. Do you think MPs should be able to have second jobs? Uh, I think it's something we should debate in the modern world. Um, at the moment, we are. I, I think there's a great benefit. You know, I mean, I think the problem is that three weeks before this all happened, I actually went to see the Commission and myself, because the new rules that Chris Bryant has introduced are really quite opaque, very difficult to understand. So I wanted to understand what the rules are so I wouldn't break any. So I'd actually been to see the Commissioner beforehand. 
Um, I think that you know, if you don't, if you say MPs aren't going to have a second job, it's going to be really tricky for the Labour Party. Don't see how anyone can be a member of a trade union and an MP because you're only there to advocate for the, your members. Um, so I think it's a really tricky area, and I think we should have a debate about it. Really interesting. One of your colleagues, who's you will know, and I won't name him now, an old lefty. Um, said to me in the lift on the Monday after that thing, he said, I don't hold with MPs having second jobs. He said, but what those people did to you and some of your colleagues, who you clearly weren't breaking the rules, was a disgrace. Interesting. Interesting take. I guess what will have been surprising to many people watching that was the sort of figures that were involved. You know, people are struggling at the moment. You know that. We all know that. And when former cabinet ministers are saying my day rate is £10,000 a day, it just seems so, so, such a million miles away from this planet. Yeah, I agree. Um, which is why I was very clear that I didn't ask for a particular sum of money. It was up to them to, to do that. And I think you know, several people have remarked to me that that was a big difference. I absolutely agree uh, that it looks a huge you know, and that's why we should have that discussion. I also think it's really, you know, I've, I know I've made mistakes in politics. We all make mistakes, and I made, I'm sure I've made enough. But I've always tried to do things honestly and to act for the best of my you know, And I suppose I took it very hard that you know, my reputation had been completely traduced for having done nothing wrong. OK, now you are on the moderate wing of the Tories you talked about. Um, hearing from Ken Clark, I'm sure, is a hero of yours. The immigration bill, it's back in Parliament next week, the illegal immigration bill. Now, you have previously said that you want assurances on that. There will be amendments that are put down by some of your colleagues who are anxious about uh, what Suella Braverman wants to introduce. What do you think you'll do next week? What are you looking for? What assurances do you need? Well, I think I don't think there's anyone who's really uh, against the principle of stopping illegal immigration. The question, as you well know, is there's illegal immigration, there's economic migrancy, and there's asylum. Uh, and I want to be able to be reassured. And there are a number of um, amendments going down, a number of which I will I will back um, about. First of all, on, on the whole asylum issue, which is ensuring that there are safe and legal routes for people to get here. Uh, recognising also that we probably should row back from what the government has said about um, modern slavery not rules not being applied here, because there were some people who will be trafficked illegally, who will be subject to modern slavery, what we would call modern slavery, if they've been coming in another way. So I want to see some discretion there. I also want to see ensure that the government is making adequate provision for under 18-year-olds uh, in terms of uh, making sure they're properly looked after, recognise that they are more vulnerable than others. And so there are a number of amendments and a number of things down. The government at committee stage, as you know, uh, re sought to reassure, uh, and I'm aware that two of my colleagues who are leading on these groups of amendments have been talking to the government fairly heavily. But I think it's really important that we have a... We maintain our reputation that, you know, if you are under threat from persecution because of your religious, political, sexual orientation or whatever, the UK will offer you a home. Now, just to briefly explain the parliamentary process, so some MPs will try and amend the government's proposals. They may not have the numbers. You will sign it, you will vote for it, but you may not have the numbers to get it through. Could you see a scenario where you, you, you don't vote for the proposals in their current form if the amendments along the lines that you suggest, are not part of the proposals? We, we should explain the parliamentary process better because a lot of it is negotiation and to get to a point. And sometimes you don't get to the perfect ending. But I am clear that uh, I want to see the government accept some of those amendments next week. Uh, and then if I, if I don't get that, uh, I am prepared for the first time, for a very long time, uh, to vote against the government on those. Thank you for being so clear on that. You did fall out with your party over... Brexit, you are pro-European. You are you serve as the deputy chair of the Conservative European Forum, which advocates closer relationship with Europe. What, in your view, should Britain be doing that it isn't doing at the moment? Well, the first thing is that the European Forum is a group that wants to strengthen our relationships both uh, at a national level, but obviously, as you say, the Conservatives, so with sister parties across Europe, because I mean 
It's across the water. It's our biggest uh, ally. It's been our biggest strategic partner in economics and diplomacy alongside the US since the Second World War. Uh, so it's, it's extraordinary that doesn't, one wouldn't want to have stronger ties. The first thing I think is that, I mean, I'm a big supporter of Rishi Sunak's. I think that what he did with the Windsor framework has started to enable us to repair some of the diplomatic relations which are important for getting those strategic. I've been struck by the number of diplomats I know in London who've said to me, that's enabling us to rebuild trust with you as a government. And that's really important. And there will be all sorts of things coming up. So the fact that it opens up those opportunities to look at how we want to have future trading opportunities as the world changes in tech, biotech, how we want to make sure that some of the tariff barriers uh, are not as, uh, as difficult as they could be, potentially even looking at some of the labeling systems that will allow goods to flow more quickly. That happens because you have trust between governments. So Sunak's achievement in the Windsor framework is not just that that was good for Northern Ireland and GB business. It actually has opened up the world again for UK. I don't know if you can give me a yes or no answer on this, but do you think we'll ever rejoin the European Union? I'm not interested in that. I've, I've got too many scars from the past yeah. battle. <laughs> me I've, too. Well, you, you and I together, and, but a lot of colleagues on both sides. Yeah. Um, it's not for my political generation. Who's to say what the next political generation will do? But at the moment, we should be interested in creating closer relationships, better economic ties with them and the whole of the world. But we shouldn't, we shouldn't have a Europe whole in our global Britain. You have been campaigning for the rights of summer born children so they can have a choice about which school year they go into. You've made a lot of progress on that. Not 100%, but you've certainly made big progress on that. Where's, where next for that campaign? What's still left to do on that? The reason why I'm smart about it, you asked me earlier why I'm a Conservative, one of them is I believe in creating opportunity and aspiration for everybody. And it was very clear to me that the life chances of children, potentially, not everybody, but not every child, but a number of children born uh, in the three months before September, which is the change of school date, were going to be their educational opportunities and educational chances slowed down if some of them needed a chance to mature into that first year, that some of them needed to stay with that cohort through, uh, and some of them when they got to secondary school did. We've made huge progress. The government twice has now issued directives. The vast majority of local authorities are accepting that. I've had a long chat with the new minister last year, and we talked about the need potentially for legislation. At the moment, I am encouraged that directive is working, but I am concerned that as children move from primary to secondary sector, there are still some authorities that then choose to try and put people up in straight into year eight rather than year seven. And so I'm watching that very carefully and that would be the next thing really to get a grip on. You're 61 years old now. How long do you want to continue to serve? Well, I'd like to continue to serve because I still think there are things to do. I've, we spoke earlier about a few things that I'm still passionate about. I believe the world's a lot in politics about small victories. It's what you can achieve for your constituents, which change their lives on a very personal level. So there's a lot to do in that area. I think there's a lot to do in social housing. Uh, and also creating more housing opportunities so that everybody feel they, you know, lots of people in London, certainly some number of my friends, don't feel, feel that London's unaffordable and it shouldn't be. We're a great capital city. I also want to do some work with my colleagues about re-establishing London as the great global city. And, you know, I've been very fortunate to be a health minister and a transport minister. And I still think that we're going to see some great changes in those areas. And I want to be involved in that. But as you rightly know, um, I serve at the pleasure of my constituents and uh, I'm under no illusion that you know, the next election is like every other election. I'm very lucky that I have, I've I built my majority from minus 3,000 up to 12 and a half and it's now 600. But I've always treated it the same. We always try to do the best for our constituents. We've always tried to work hard and we'll see what the next election brings. Indeed, we will, Stephen Hammond. I didn't know you very well uh, before today. But thanks very much. Uh, for giving us an insight into your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Back next Sunday, 6 pm, Gloria Meets. I'm Jacob Rees Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former government minister. For years, I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop 
failures, famine, war, <laughs> suffering on a scale completely unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, nah, no, nah, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We